This is week number six um, in our series called Gentle and Lowly, and we are talking about the heart of Christ all this time. And this week uh, in particular, I want to ask the question of you, and I want you to think a little bit about it. might feel a little disconnected, um, the, the message today. There's kind of two different parts. Uh, there's a book that we're reading. It's called Gentle and Lowly, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking about his heart. And we'll have it on the screen here, Nathan, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Jesus is speaking about his heart, and he describes his heart this way. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary, all of you who are carrying heavy burdens. If you have the humility, right, the wisdom, the desire, come to him, Jesus says. Come to me. And I will give you rest, right? I'll give you this peace in your life that you can't find any other way. He says, take my yoke or take my direction, my teachings, take my leading upon you, follow me. He says, let me teach you, not what the world teaches, not how others teach, but Jesus says, let me teach you because I'm humble and I'm gentle at heart. Other translations say, I am gentle and lowly at heart and you will find rest for your souls. When you come to me, Right? Jesus says you are going to find rest for your souls. So I want to ask a question this morning. What is it about the heart of Jesus that attracts you to him? What is it about the heart of Jesus? Why are you drawn towards, not Christianity, but why are you drawn towards Jesus? You know, I think about, okay, that's a... a question I've been grappling with thinking about this last this last week or so and you know and I think well I wonder you know what is it that drew me to Debbie you know we and I can't say anything because she's will kill me if I said what drew me to her you know she would just she would she would kill me and she just left the auditorium because (laughs) (laughs) so you know but there's lots of things but I'm not going to tell you because I'll be in trouble and that will I won't have a good weekend so but (laughs) There's lots of things that drew me to her. But I want you to think about people in your life, you know, somebody that you love, that you care about. There's obviously something outwardly, you know, and maybe not outwardly, but there's probably something outwardly that initially drew you to a person that you're attracted to. And as you got to know them over time, there's something probably internally that you saw about them. You know, it may have changed a little bit. Initially, you were attracted to this. And, you know, the more you got to know them, their heart was revealed to you. And you were drawn closer to them because of their heart, right, because of their character, because of who they were on the inside of their life. Well, what is it about the heart of Jesus that you find attractive, that draws you to him? Um, this is interesting. Our book, chapter, I think, 10, he talks about the beauty of Christ. What do you find beautiful about Jesus Christ? I like how he put it. The author says this. He says, we are drawn to God by the beauty of the heart of Christ or the heart of Jesus. He says what most deeply attracts us to Christ is his gentle, tender, and humble heart. Then he goes on, he says, let the heart of Jesus be something that is not only gentle towards you. This is not a fill-in, just highlight it. He says, let the heart of Jesus be something that is not only gentle towards you, but let the heart of Jesus be something that is lovely to you. The heart of Christ. It's how he feels about you. His desire to draw you near. What what attracts me to the heart of Christ? It's how he feels about me. And how he feels about what I'm going through and the situation, his empathy, his compassion, his understanding. You know, it's interesting, Jeremiah chapter 13, it's not on your notes, it won't be up there, but Jeremiah chapter 13, um, Jeremiah is, is, is speaking forth for God and God says, hey, he says, you know, my people are meant to be like a sash this, th- that I would wear around me and they're supposed to represent me to the world, to draw people to me, to express my grace and my beauty and my loveliness. He says, but you've been disobedient and you've not done this. I wonder, are people drawn to Jesus Christ because of your relationship with him? Do you express the heart of Christ to other people? The beauty of Jesus. I was thinking about this this week, the beauty of Christ. And some of you may identify with this. I just wrote in my notes, I wrote, the problem or the profane part 
of using Jesus' name in vain. I want you to think about this. Listen. The profane part of using Jesus' name in vain is the association with his name we make with the pain, suffering, sin, and agony of life. All things that make him very angry. So often, I hear people, even people who are Christ followers, something bad, something tragic, something bitter, something disappointing, something hurtful happens in their life. And what do they say? They say, Jesus Christ. But they're not saying it in an honoring way. They're associating Jesus with the pain, with the suffering, with the sin, with the agony, with the bitterness of life that's going on in their life right now. And that's what makes it so profane. You are associating the beauty of Christ with the pain and the suffering and the bitterness of life. And don't you know that Satan loves it? When people profane Jesus' name, they take the beauty of Christ and they relate it to the pain and the suffering of life. And that profanes the name of Jesus. Satan loves it. When you associate pain and suffering with Jesus, we profane the name of Jesus when we do this. We associate his name with the pain and suffering, the agony of life. All things which make Jesus angry. What draws you to Jesus Christ? Why are you drawn to him? I think part of the thing that, um, that I, as I was thinking and praying a lot about this week, is that this may feel a little bit, this is where it may feel a little bit of dissonance, but part of what draws me to Jesus, how he feels about me, is how he feels about what I'm going through. That Jesus not only has compassion, Randy, Dr. Daniels talked about that several weeks ago, how Jesus has compassion for me and the situations that I'm going through. But one of the things that I find that draws me to Jesus is that Jesus gets angry. He gets angry at the suffering. He gets angry at the bitterness or the brokenness, the sin and the suffering that's going on and my life is going through. That draws me to Jesus. To know that Jesus cares about what's going on. And it hurts him and he gets angry about the suffering in my life. You know, I was thinking this week about two different situations. I was thinking about the 15-year-old girl who went to a Dallas Mavericks basketball game with her dad. And she went to the restroom during the middle of the game. And she didn't come back to her seat. And so after some time, her dad goes to the, to the security and says, hey, my daughter's disappeared. And they're like, oh, well, you know, we'll file a missing persons report that she's a runaway. He's like, no, no, she didn't run away. Something's happened to my daughter. And they're like, well, you need to go back to your, since you're not from Dallas, you need to go back from wherever you're at. It's like 30 miles away or something like that. You need to go back there and you need to report it to them. And he goes back home and he's like, you know, knowing something has happened to his daughter. And he goes back home and he reports it to them. And they're like, well, we're not sure if we can, this happened in Dallas. And there was this back and forth. And it wasn't until several hours later, like 2 a.m. in the morning, they finally file a missing person, not just a runaway, but a missing person's report on this girl, figuring out, realizing that they had she'd been abducted in the middle of a basketball game at American Airlines Arena. And the dad takes it upon himself. He's not just waiting for somebody to do something. He hires a detective or something like this, and they are pursuing, they are looking, they are searching for this girl. And a week later, they find the girl had been kidnapped and was in Oklahoma City and had been sex trafficked for the past week. You don't think that that dad was angry because he loved his daughter because of the brokenness, because of the sin, because of the pain that was going on in her life? You don't think that Jesus gets angry at the sin, at the brokenness? 
that Jesus is compassionate in that way for you, over you, that Jesus is not indifferent. Some of us think, oh, well, he's gentle and lowly. and That's true, but he's not indifferent to what's going on in your life. Jesus is angrier about whatever it is that you're going through than you could ever even imagine. His love is greater, it's higher, more deeply than we can ever understand. But so is his anger at what's going on in our lives. Jesus gets angry. You don't think that Jesus was angry this week at the mass murder that happened in Texas? Jesus was angry at the suffering that was going on. You know, our story, uh, John chapter 11, our, our story, but our passage this morning uh, comes from John chapter 11. And Nate, you can go all the way back to like starting in verse 16. It's like the fifth slide back. You know, John chapter 11 tells the story that Jesus is uh, in Jerusalem and he's with his disciples and his good friend, a guy named Lazarus, is sick. And the report comes to him. And Jerusalem and Beth, uh, Bethany were only just... Several, a few miles apart. You know, some you know, theologians say it was only probably about two or three miles apart. I mean, I could have ran there in about 14 minutes, right? It's close. But Jesus intentionally, purposely doesn't go for days. 14 minutes. You could fast walk. You could have been there in 21 minutes. He waits days to go there. Part of the reason he says is that he wants God to be glorified in this situation. That he know God, God had a plan and a purpose. But John, excuse me, uh, yeah, John chapter 11 verse 17 goes like this, starts like this. says, finally after four days, it says when Jesus finally arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary Because her brother Lazarus was dead. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said, Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Have you ever felt like that? Jesus, if you had just showed up. Jesus, where were you? If you just showed up, this would not have happened. She says, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said, your brother will rise again, Martha. Yeah, I I know he will rise when everybody else rises at the resurrection this last day. Jesus said, no, no, Martha, I'm the resurrection. I am the life. And anyone who believes in me will live Even after dying, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? She's like, well, yeah, Lord, of course. I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God. I've always believed you're the one who has come come into the world from God. And then she returned to her sister Mary, verse 28 says, and she called Mary aside from the mourners. She said, hey, Mary, the teacher, Jesus is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him, and Jesus stayed outside the village at the place where Martha had met him. He was waiting, and he says, when the people who were at the house, they were consoling Mary, saw her leave so quickly, so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to cry, to weep. And so they followed her there. When Mary arrived, and she saw Jesus, she fell at his feet. She said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing, when he saw the pain, when he saw the suffering, when he saw the brokenness, when he saw the human condition, suffering because of not necessarily the sin of somebody, but sin in our world, the effect it was having upon them, when he saw them weeping and wailing with her, deep anger, Jesus got angry. It welled up within him. And he was deeply troubled by this. Where have you put him, he asked. They said, they told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. 
and people were standing nearby said, oh, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed the blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry. He was angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with the stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, he said. But Martha, the, the, but Martha, the, the dead man's sister, said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. There will be a terrible smell in there. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? So they rolled the stone aside and Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I have said this out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. And he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And of course, Lazarus arises and comes out of the tomb. We see in the story in John chapter 11 the emotions of Jesus. We see the compassion that Jesus has. And we see the anger about the brokenness, the suffering, and the pain of life. Part of what, I don't know about you, but part of what draws me to the beauty of Christ is knowing that I have a defender and a protector. And I know that I have someone that when sin and suffering and brokenness is happening to me, that Jesus is not an indifferent He's not indifferent to my situation. But he gets angry about it. And he moves on my behalf. There's lots and lots of passages I could have given you, but real quickly, I just wanted to give you five things this morning that I, as I thought and prayed about this week. Five situations, five times that where Jesus got angry. What makes Jesus angry is what I title it on your notes. There's five villains. And I think the very first thing is, right, the human condition. What makes Jesus angry is the human, is the condition that we find ourselves in. And he gets angry because of his compassion for what I'm facing and what you're facing. Jesus gets angry because people are being led astray. He gets angry because of the suffering, because of the consequences of sin. He wept. And it says that he was angry about that. Jesus is going into Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. And it says that he wept and he cried over the people of Jerusalem because he knew that they were being led astray. And he was broken about that. He knew what they were going to face and the consequences of disobedient and a sinful life. And so that he wept. And that he gets angry about situations like that. I think a second time that I thought about this week as I look through scripture, a second time when I find Jesus gets angry, what keeps him angry rules that keep people from him. Right? Oftentimes we see these man-made rules that keep people from God's power. We see man-made rules that keep people from his presence. We see man-made rules that keep people from being delivered. And all these different passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We see these religious leaders who had all these man-made rules. that said, Jesus, there are people that are suffering. There are people that are hurting. But we have these rules. And Jesus, you shouldn't or you can't. You can't do something because we've got rules. Had nothing to do with scripture. It was just man-made. And these rules kept people from being delivered. From being healed. Oftentimes we see that. that People create these barriers, these man-made rules that keep people from God. And it makes Jesus angry. I think a third time, this is an obvious one, that we see when, when, when kids are being pushed aside, right? 
time and time again. We see all these different passages, all the different gospels kind of mention the situation where people, the kids are coming to Jesus and the disciples and other people are trying to push the kids away. And Jesus gets upset about it. He's like, no, no, let the kids come to me. I want them to come to me. I want these children to be in my presence. And it made him angry that they would push these kids aside. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, you know what? It's better to throw a, put a millstone around your neck and to throw yourself into the ocean or into the sea than rather cause one of these little kids to stumble. Quit pushing these kids aside. Why are you doing that? It made him angry when his own disciples would push these kids aside. We have to be careful. You know this, um, I don't know if I, I think I wrote it down. One of the quotes or one of the things that um, the author of this book that we've been reading this past week, if you're following along, he says this, and this is super powerful. He says, our goal as parents is that our kids would leave our house at 18 and would, would be um, unable to live the rest of their lives believing that their sins and their sufferings repel Christ. He said, let me say this again, our goal our goal is that our kids would leave the house at 18 and be unable to live the rest of their lives believing that their sins and their sufferings repel Christ. Don't push the kids aside, Jesus said. Don't let them believe that their sin would repel them from me. I think a fourth thing that I think upset Jesus it's people who are religious phonies. They pretended to have it all together while ignoring the sinfulness of their own hearts. You've been around people like that. They're just pretenders, hypocrites, religious phonies. Jesus says, hey, you guys are all so worried about the outside, the outward appearance. He said, but it's your heart. It's the interior of your life. You've cleaned the outside, but the inside of your life is a disaster. And you won't turn to me. You won't follow me. And he got angry with people like that. We're religious phonies. I think a fifth group of people or fifth situation that where it would make Jesus oftentimes angry is when people made it difficult for people to get to God. When people made it difficult for others to get to God. And I thought about two different situations. These both Matthew, John chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 21, these situations, are they sound very, very familiar. Two different times, they're three years apart. Jesus goes to the temple and people are selling things and they're greedy and they're, they're making it impossible or very difficult for people to come into God's presence and experience his power. In both these situations, in John 2 and Matthew 21, it says that Jesus came and he cleansed the temple. He drove out these money changers and people who were taking advantage of everybody else. And they were making it difficult for people. They were distracting people from coming into the presence and the power of God. And Jesus got really upset and really angry about that. As a matter of fact, John chapter 2, I think verse 15, says that Jesus made a whip. He made a whip. And he drove people out of this court where all these things were taking place. Again, in Matthew chapter 21, it says that he got angry and he drove people out. Because they were making it difficult for people to get to God. To experience God's presence and God's power in their lives. Part of what draws me to Jesus I know he gets angry about things that have happened to me. I want to read this last quote to you, and it's a little bit long, and, um, but if I, this, the author said it so much better than I could ever have said it. He said this. He says, perhaps you have been sinned against. That's all of us. Perhaps you've been sinned against, and the only appropriate response is anger. Ephesians chapter 4 says to be angry and sin not. It's okay to get angry. It's what you do with that anger. James says you be slow to anger. It doesn't say don't get angry. Perhaps you've been sinned against and the only appropriate response to being sinned against is anger. 
He says, be comforted by this. Jesus is angry alongside of you. He joins you in your anger. Indeed, he is angrier than you could ever be about the wrong that has been done to you. Your just anger is a shadow of his. And his anger, unlike yours, has zero taint of sin in it. This morning, as you consider those who have wronged you, let Jesus be angry on your behalf. His anger can be trusted, for it is an anger that springs from his compassion for you. The indignation that Jesus felt when he came upon mistreatment of others in the Bible and the Gospels is the same indignation he feels now in heaven upon mistreatments of you. And that knowledge this morning, release your debtor and breathe again. Let Christ's heart for you not only wash you in his compassion, but let Christ for you assure you of his solidarity and rage against all that distresses you, most certainly death and hell. Just like Jesus' love is greater than anything you could ever imagine, so is his anger at your hurt at your pain, at your suffering, at the brokenness of our world, at the consequences of sin, of others sinning upon you, causing you that hurt and pain. You can be drawn to the heart of Christ because he's angry for you in the midst of his compassion. Randy's going to come in a moment, but before he does, I want to take a moment and I want to pray for us. Maybe you just bow your heads this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just like, I, I was not expecting this. Well, I wasn't either. This is just where I felt like the, Jesus was leading us this week. And maybe you can identify, but you're like, Pastor Red, I, I have just had so much rage, and resentment towards somebody or something that's happened in my life. So this morning, I want to encourage you to release that situation, that per person, to Jesus this morning. Say, Jesus, I'm casting my cares, my burdens on you because you have compassion for me. You care for me. And you are far angrier about this. And I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. So this morning, I release this situation to you. I give it to you. And I ask that you would work and that you would move and that you would have your way. Jesus, you see all the hurt, the pain, the suffering. You see those who are experiencing brokenness this morning. Deeper, Lord, than anybody else in this room could even possibly begin to imagine. Jesus, you know. Lord, help us to release these situations, these moments, these experiences, these persons to you. And trust you. And ask for you to work and move in our hearts in a way far above and beyond what we could ever dream or hope or ask. Jesus, may we experience your presence and your power this morning, this moment, in this place, in this way, because you love us. Draw us to your beauty, Jesus. Jesus. Amen.